Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of In Range. This is actually the final conclusion. Kind of sad in a way. Some people thought it would never come. Never end. The Walwood Stoner Dew Project. Um, we, we took a long time getting here because we really wanted to be very thoughtful about every subcomponent in this gun. Yeah. And uh, that's what took this a while. Now some people said, why? And you just do this in a week or two because we went through a, a number of ways of testing and we went through a number of iterations of parts. Yep quite a lot of stuff to get to where we're at like for example a couple things didn't work out quite the way we wanted we went somewhere else or did this or that or tried a bunch of subcomponents to see would this work better than that would this do this would this do that and so that's how we came to the conclusion we came to and when the conclusion we've come to is we're finally talking about the 14.5 inch super lightweight carbine yep. which is interesting because i have mine right here which is the one i used throughout the entire what would stone do project and i have mine here which you've never seen before yeah yes as the viewer yeah because you made a conclusion after going through the What Would Stoner Do project and shooting your uh, longer rifle. We originally started with yours being a DMR. We realized it wasn't. It was just a longer rifle for a little longer range. Yep. And we had my carbine. And when we were done with the project, your conclusion was? I just don't have the need for the extra barrel length and the extra magnification. Yep. Everything I will ever want to do with that rifle, I think, I can do just as well or even better with the shorter carbine. Yep. Shorter carbine is substantially lighter weight. It is. Um, in fact... For the final tally, I measured this without the sling and without the light. Okay, so you had the hollow sun on it. With the optic. Okay. Five pounds, 2.9 ounces. Five pounds, 2.9 ounces. Yeah. I think we've been understating. We've actually been, uh, we've been telling people that this was about a six pound gun. Well, well it we is when you pile all this extra junk on it. Well, the reason you want to have such a light gun is so you can pile on the extra junk and still have a light gun. Right. So this gun, even with the light and the laser and this little vertical, vertical grip doodad and the magnifier is still lighter weight than an iron sighted M16A2 by a large degree. Yeah. Pounds lighter. Yeah. And that translates into a carryability, carryability, handleability, and agility that you just don't have with a big heavy gun. Right. Boy, did I learn that hard in the Red October match when I brought out that Alpha AK. And I actually, you know, it was really closely simulating some of the guns they saw captured in Syria and things like that. Right. And some of the stuff those guys need on their gun, they need them in the, in the field. But when you try to be fast and dynamic with a gun that weighs 13 pounds, it is a lot harder thing to be fast and dynamic. You know, and the other side of that is there are people who are going to hear that and say, well, you're clearly just a weakling and you right. need to go to the gym. Sure. The, no matter all of that aside, every pound of gun is one pound less of anything else that you can carry. Good point. Whether you can carry 20 pounds of stuff total or uh, 200 pounds of stuff, mm -hmm. every pound that's on your gun is one pound that you cannot have of something else. And that's the military application of something like this. It's, I got 15 pounds of rifle and ammo. Do you want seven pounds of rifle and eight pounds of ammo? Or do you want five pounds of rifle and ten pounds of ammo? Ammo. Which one's more useful? Yeah. But also, no matter how strong you are, how capable you are, the reality is a lightweight gun that balances well, the transition between targets, it's all of that matters. better. It's a huge yep. deal. It makes such a difference. Exactly. The stronger you are, the, the more you can exploit a very light rifle. However, even if you aren't particularly strong, this rifle now becomes viable to people that don't have those capabilities. Exactly. Um, we've seen a number of people that aren't necessarily big brawny dudes, and they pick up this gun and it absolutely suits them in a way that the traditional M4 configuration with the cheese grater rails at, you know, nine pounds, something ounces. And the big, heavy grenade launcher cut barrel. On top, exactly. All that in included. Now, another thing that's interesting about this is that when you look at, like, some people say bullpups. And bullpups are generally a little heavy, but they balance well towards the rear. Mm -hmm. When the gun's light enough, as this is, this kind of one-handed manipulation that you normally would see people doing with a bullpup because of the balance ring in the rear becomes just as capable with this light gun because it doesn't matter. Right. It weighs five pounds, two ounces. Yeah. Yeah. Especially one like this that, well, and even more so if you take the light off of it. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm doing that yeah. with all my, you know, force multiplying garbage on the front. Yep. But, and, and the reason for this on my gun, by the way, um, was to test that viability out. Right. It wasn't necessarily that we were going to have a practical application of an IR laser at a match, and we knew that. But having it on there told me things about my rail system, whether or not it was going to retain zero, which, by the way, it does. Yep. Um, and all that extra little bit of weight out there, how does the gun balance now that I have things that normally are considered kind of a requirement on what you would consider a tactically applied rifle? The laser, maybe not. The light absolutely yeah. is a requirement. Yeah. Um, so other things we learned in the process, and we've talked about this before in the project, these carbon mm -hmm. fiber flow tubes, besides being very strong mm -hmm. and very light, they actually are really good about heat. Yeah. So we had a little bit of a concern at first that the, the gas tube comes up right underneath this handguard, because this handguard's fairly small in diameter, deliberately, uh, and we never had any issues with the handguard heating up. In fact, 
what's really kind of cool is out here in the Arizona desert, mm -hmm. now it's winter right now, but we were running these during the summer. And normally at a match or any anything, you leave the gun out in the summer in the sun and it will literally become hot enough to burn you, you if you touch it. Not a round fire, you pick the gun up and it will scorch you to the point where you cannot actually use the gun comfortably. Right. I've had worse scores because when I went to shoot, the gun was burning me to the point that I could not concentrate on what I was trying to do. Yeah. The polymer G-Wax stock, doesn't do that. Doesn't do that as badly. And the carbon fiber flow tube doesn't do it at all. It's an incredible, uh, it's incredibly good at not being heat absorbent. That is something we did not anticipate, didn't expect. Yep. It turns out to be a really cool side benefit. That's not something the Arctic guys are gonna be all that concerned about, but it's really nice down here in the desert. Yep, and then we had some things that were a little bit of shift. I do have a piece of Picatinny rail here at the front. Nothing on it right now, but that is where I can put my quick detach Harris bipod. Yep. I decided that unfortunately the bipod we were trying to use just didn't quite cut it. Yeah, we're, so, we never did come up with a totally appropriate bipod. Put a little piece of rail right there with a QD. Yep. One thing I would like to say is that we did mention that the gas tube is very close to the 12 o'clock position of that rail system. Mm -hmm. It is difficult to mount objects or things on these m lock slots right here because the rail and the gas tube are quite close. Yeah. It is possible, but difficult. So really these slots here are usable. The ones near the rear are not, not really important. There's not really anything I want to put there. Yeah. Um, other things that were very controversial about the project <laughs> is the fact that we, no irons. we eschewed the use of iron sights or backup polymer sights or any form of backup iron sights. We don't have them on the front here on the top and we don't have them in the rear. And the reason for that really wasn't because we were trying to tell you, you should not ever have backup sights, which is by the way, the way the world decided to take it. Yeah. Typical internet. Um, but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose for that was to prove that we had faith in a relatively low cost Chinese manufactured optic. Yeah. And that things have gotten so good that we did not think that this would fail under any conditions that we were going to use it in. And therefore we were not worried about having backup iron sights. Yours is kind of beat up there. But quite honestly, it is beat to crap. It is scraped <laughs> very badly. It has been hit a number of times. And I gotta say, part and parcel of one of the things that we wanted to do with the What Would Stone Do project was to modernize the sighting system. And we landed up going with a hollow sun because it brought things to the table that other companies that are a little bit more conservative have not done yet. Right. It has an auto adjustment brightness, it has an EOTech reticle, and it has, more importantly, a solar panel on the top, allowing this to work in pretty much any conditions and yes. keep the thing running. And on top of that, it does auto adjustment of brightness, yeah. which normally I turn off, but I found it to work really well. There are pros and cons to that. Generally works okay. Yeah. Yep, on top of that, the other reason, go ahead, were you gonna say something? Uh, I was, uh, okay. I have a follow up here. The other part I was gonna say is the other reason for not having backup iron sights okay. on the gun. This is exactly what I was about okay. to say. Was because I wanted the free rail space. Now, right. I'm gonna pose this to you and you don't have to agree, and I know some of you are not going to. I believe the rail space conservation that's on this, not weight, but the rail space conservation, allows me to do more important things with the rifle than having backup iron sights that, by the way, I have never deployed on any gun I've ever had them on in any situation. Now. If your gun gets hit with bullets or whatever, you got a problem. You got a bigger problem than backup iron sights probably, <laughs> but I've never had an optic fail in a way that I had to flip up a backup iron sight to rely on them or do something to keep going. So since I have so much faith in, in, some, in the modern optics, what I'd rather have is this rail space open to put where I want it to be for eye relief, my magnifier. And I've got the magnifier on as a QD, so if I don't want the magnifier on there, I could take that off, mm -hmm. reduce the weight of the gun, put this in my pack and now I have, I'm back closer to my five pound, two ounce gun. Yep. But oh gee, golly gee, things are bad today. Things are far away. Really, I want this, pop it on. And if I had a backup iron sight on there, the ability to put that magnifier where I want it you is can. now changed. You could put a backup iron and then put the magnifier super close. But people were talking about length of pull and armor. If you're putting on a magnifier that slightly changes your eye relief, you can adjust your eye relief now by changing where you put the optic on the rail. Right. And there's yet another potential reason to want that rail space, and mm -hmm. that's night vision. That is. Why don't you hold this for a moment? Oh, so, God. oh wait, it's not heavy at all. So this is actually a cool product that I found a long time ago. I forgot even who makes it. I think it's U.S. Palm or was U.S. Palm. You got your helmet. Cool. But you got this pouch in your helmet. Even cooler. Get rid of the helmet. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, it's a way to carry your night vision in an armored way without carrying a separate night vision container. Yeah, in the helmet. So Neat. here's my PVS-14, which in most modern applications you see people using them. They have them helmet mounted because they want to be able to do things with uh, without being weapon mounted. And they use their IR laser as their aiming device. Mm -hmm. Typically it's very hard with a helmet mounted PVS-14 to get behind even a red dot. Right. Doable, very challenging. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to pose this out there. Everyone goes, ah, everyone helmet mounts their night vision. If you're going against uh, an equal force that also has night vision, you know what you don't want to be doing? emanating IR lasers. An IR laser goes that way and it goes right back to you. Yeah. So at that point you have to start doing things that are more passive. 
right. or you may want to be passive for other reasons. So, because we have the rail space saved by getting rid of the iron sights, I can take this off, then my helmet, put on my PVS-14, crank that on. There are many mounting systems for PVS-14. This is just the, the super simple one I've got on here. Mm -hmm. And whamalama, I am now in passive night vision mode. Yep. And I'm on a weapon, I'm not emanating an IR laser. I can actually use this to look through this and I have everything freed up. I don't have anything hanging off my helmet or head. Maybe I don't have a helmet. And now I have night vision capabilities. Other accessories may apply, like for example, the uh, what's that corner shot, that corner system yeah. we had? If you wanted that, if you had some sort of down. ninety degree or angle angle shot kind of thing, one Again, of those cool things. It's a thing you couldn't do if you had a plastic magpul sight sitting there instead. It would make it more, far more challenging, if not possible now, at all. You are going out there and you're making the claim that a PVS fourteen is going to be more useful on that than a plastic iron sight. Yes, and I think it is. <laughs> sure I'm gonna go that? ahead and say that a PVS-14 is a more valuable piece of equipment to have on your rifle than a, P a plastic backup iron sight. Now, uh, you know, there are, again, there are situations where maybe that backup iron sight could save your life, but the situations in which you're going to probably need some other four piece of equipment on your gun are highly more likely than that backup iron sight situation that, in my opinion, and I'm not always, is mostly lower. So let's be fair that there are really two applications that we're talking about. One is serious military application, mm -hmm. in which case things like this, and you see this when you look at a lot of pictures of a lot of special forces guys, not just American, but around the world, they often don't have a backup iron sight because they've got something more valuable there, whether it's a magnifier or a night vision device. Or some other thing, a thermal. I mean, yeah. it could be yeah. any sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other group are people who are recreational or competitive shooters. Mm -hmm. And for that group, a backup iron sight isn't relevant. If your scope breaks, you go home and you fix it well, or replace it. It hurts your score that day. Fine, but I don't know that the backup iron sight is going to be all that much of a help. Your score is trashed when your optic goes down if, in the first place. If you're in tax scope with your cool 1 to 50x magnifier and, and, and that thing decides to die that day, right. the iron sights aren't going to fix your score in that stage for that day. So yeah. you're out of that match. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you're using a red dot sight, I'd still rather have the rail space for just a magnifier yeah. than, than anything else. Yeah, even for in, a competition even gun. Even in competition Or a recreational gun. gun. Plus the ability to take things on and mm -hmm. off is reducing or increasing weight necessary based on what you're trying to do at that particular moment. Yeah. Other stuff that was controversial about this, of course, is we went with the G-Wax polymer lower. Yep. Now we have videos in every one of these subcomponents, but this is the conclusion. Yeah. This was controversial. I um, love this thing. I, I do too. Um, what I was going to say about that is the... First of all, it's more durable than you'd think. It's the only yeah. durable polymer lower on the market. They've been run, I literally have run these over with cars intentionally and unintentionally, and these survive when aluminum lowers do not. Right, because yeah. these flex and then they come back. They Some, bend elastically, aluminum just bends plastic. Some of the reasons that they have that rigidity is because there's a honeycomb in here, and it was designed to be a polymer lower out of the box. It wasn't an aluminum lower suddenly made in polymer. Right. Now that means you don't have a interchangeable uh, pistol grip, you can't change the length of pull, and our contention throughout this entire project is doesn't matter. People, this isn't comfortable. You know what? I found this to be the case. There's a lot of things I found to not be comfortable until I'm shooting it on the clock and realize it doesn't matter. Yeah. That comfort that's suddenly so important to make sure it completely, you know, completely fits my hand, like that adjust a grip or whatever we saw at Chacho. You know what? That's cool when you're at home playing with it, but when you're on the clock or you're trying to hit targets, as long as it isn't so uncomfortable that it's impeding your ability to perform, it's it, irrelevant. It just doesn't matter. It's literally irrelevant. Yeah. And the length of pull, not irrelevant but almost irrelevant. So much so that for me, the added benefit of it doesn't pluck mustache hairs makes enough difference that I'd rather have this than an adjustable stock. Now, obviously we're not gonna argue that not plucking mustache hairs is going to be important when you're fighting ISIS in you know, Elbonistan. Hey, you know what? It makes the rifle more comfortable. It does. <laughs> How, however, and people go, well, with armor, you need an adjustable length. Well, I just argued a couple points earlier in the video that changed that. By not having the backup iron sights and adjusting where the eye relief is required for my quick detach optic, if I set my quick detach optic with the eye relief that I have when I have armor on, and therefore it is further back or further forward, guess what I can do? I can move it. Yeah. Especially with a magnifier that doesn't change the zero of your red dot by applying it or taking it right. on or off. If you obviously, if it's a gun, if it's one that has a zero like a variable, you're not going to be moving it around. But if you have the right variable, another thing we did in the project, we found that eye relief is not that important on many of the high-end quality variables. Right. They have a large, wide eye box. Yep. And people say, well, you don't shoot in armor, and I will argue, yes, we do. We've shot matches in a, a lot of times in armor, and this, once again, just like the pistol grip not being interchangeable, 
kind of vanishes on the clock. You know, I think some of the armor, the, the adjustable stock for armor comes from the 80s and 90s. Mm. When it wasn't rifle plate carriers, it was these giant Michelin man flak vest suits. And you still see those in some uh, some armies, but yeah. I think I'll, I don't think anybody in the civilian world is deliberately using that stuff anymore. Um, and, or and certainly not trying to build their gear around it. And hopefully most militaries aren't either. And I think they're starting to get away from it. You know, now, we're another thing, you made a good point, I think, by saying 80s, for example. You know what was not really common in the 80s? Quality, high-end, futuristic optics. Yeah. So, if there was a length of pull issue with iron sights... My OEG was great. No. Oh. <laughs> but iron sights matters more. You yeah. need a consistent cheek weld and a consistent head placement on the comb to get accurate hits with irons. Yeah. And therefore, length of pull, when it changes, dependent on what you have on, matters a lot with iron sights. Yeah. Far more than it would with absolutely zero doesn't matter with, with a red dot. dot. And very little with a magnifier, as long as you've got rail space to change the eye relief, dependent on what you have on that particular day. Yeah. One more thing we didn't get into already. I just yeah. brought up the red dot again. We went with a red dot on the carbine, and you have a hollow sun there. You decided yep. to copy that idea. It doesn't have to be a hollow sun. We like the hollow sun right. because of the things that it brought to the table. But what a red dot does, especially on a carbine that's designed for zero to 300 yards, as well as CQB, or at a match, close range targets, with that EOTech reticle helps a lot. Guess what you have? Absolutely zero eye relief. Yeah. You bring the gun up. If there's a red dot or a reticle in the field of view, anywhere in the field of view, you can fire and hit the target. Yeah. And when speed matters and time matters, and we're talking milliseconds, the Red Dot is the fastest sighting system you could possibly leverage on a gun. It's also dramatically easier to use in awkward positions. If you uh -huh. have to shoot from your weak shoulder, if you have to shoot from weird, you know, bending over, you have uh, a VTAC barricade uh -huh. where you have to shoot with the rifle horizontal. Roll over prone under a vehicle. Any number of those things yep. without the eye relief requirements of a magnified optic or iron sights. These are just way easier to use. A high-end variable will get very close. We found that yeah. to be the case with the Trigicon AccuPoint that we're like, man, the it's eye relief close. on this is so forgiving at 1x, and I'm like, yeah. but when the day is done and things are said, the red dot is still, in my opinion, the possible fastest sighting system you can have. Even reflex sights and things like that, which are technically, they're actually 1x. It's different right. than 0x. I know, I know that's not the exact terminology, but I'm going to go ahead and call it 0x because there's absolutely no form of magnification going on at all. It's a lens in front of you with a reticle projected on it. You're just looking through it. Yeah. And therefore, no aberration of your sight picture, no aberration of what you're looking at downrange besides maybe some color hue or tint. Yep. And you just have a reticle that you use in whatever position it's at to get a hit. Yeah. It's huge. So we like the concept of the red dot. We like the hollow sun. We would never denigrate someone for picking something different than the Hollow Sun as long as it's it, it, as good or better. If you want to go put an Aimpoint Comp M5, awesome, do it. And, and to answer that question, by the way, uh, the uh, the Hollow the Hollow Sun 50C3 or 503C at least. Um, it is not a uh, tax-free live uh, company. Um, you can reduce, this actually does have a low enough setting that it will work with the night vision yes. without a problem. Yep. I was able to do that without any issues at all. Yeah. You just go to the lowest setting and you're good. And yeah. you turn off the auto adjustment. <laughs> yeah. So, but other than that, I mean, gosh, what else is there to say at this point, really? Well, like a, I built a new upper yep. um, to have a carbine length upper. Yeah. Because I just came to the, every time we, by the end of this project, we were getting to places, I'm like, That actually happened when we were at um, we were at Tiger Valley. Yeah, you were you were using your gun very effectively, but there were a number of times where you said, you know, I wish I just had the carbine. Yeah, it would yep. have been better. Yep. So, and oh, one more now thing. Now I do. One more thing. I do have this Nito hmm. thingamajig wrapped around my stock. Yeah. One thing that could be better on the lower is it could have better places to adjust, to put your yeah. your sling. However, if you know how, I notice what we've done with Ian. We standardized on the VTAC two point quick adjustable. There are others on the market. However, the VTAC's tail, at least, is long enough that you can actually just wrap it through the stock, cinch it down at the top at the 12 o'clock or 2 o'clock, wherever you want it. As long as you get it tight enough, it's a little you know, loose here, but it doesn't matter. This gives you where you want your sling to be with a two-point anyway. Yeah. So you don't need any special hardware on the stock to do that. This happens to be something that I think Cav Arms made before Cav Arms went away, and I okay. had it in a drawer. But there, <laughs> Blue Force Gear makes one similar. Okay. You could do the same thing with Blue Force Gear, but you don't need that. If you, at least with the VTAC, the tail's long enough to go ahead and yeah. sling it up, and you're good to go. God, I'm sure we're forgetting something cool. The PDQ lever, you, yep. that turned out to be a big deal. Uh, yeah, that really helps for um, for handling. Yep. For being able to, as a, as a long hander, mag in, bolt closed. Or if you're in an ambidextrous situation, even if you're a right hander, that yeah. does apply. Yeah. You don't need it, but it's an interesting part. I think we, we've harped on this before, but the bad lever is just a bad idea. Um, we saw, in fact, we saw another problem with them mm -hmm. at Desert Brutality. Yep, we did. It wasn't an ND, but we had a guy break. 
uh, his, his bad lever broke and it messed up his trigger group in the that, process. But that said, after we started paying attention to people running bad levers, we saw no less than three NDs at matches with bad levers. Yeah, and don't do it. I had one myself, not at a match, but out here when we were trying to film and I was doing something, I fired the gun. I'm like, yeah, that's gone. <laughs> Off forever. No extra controls in the fire control group ever. Yeah. Do not, do Nothing not put in the them in there. Card. So, so PDQ works great. By the way, someone's gonna yeah, mention you're, this. You're this is loose. Yeah. That is not a problem. What happened is I just did not blue Loctite that down. This is held in with a screw. So before anyone says anything, <laughs> this is still working. It just happened to be I didn't blue Loctite that and I should have. So that's no big deal. What else? So the charging handle, we landed up going with the Geisley ACH charging handle. Super not, charging handle. We went with the Super, which means the wings are a little bigger. Yeah. You know what? People gave us a lot of recommendations on others on the market as well. We couldn't try them all. We tried several. We did. And the Geisley is expensive, but it just worked really. And it didn't catch on any gear. Nope, nope, never had an issue with it. And of course, we've got the SLT-1 trigger yep. in here from KE Arms. Yep. They now have an SLT-2, which has a flat trigger if you're so inclined. In general, let's give our conclusions about the What Would Stoner Do project. What do you think about, what did you think going into this project? Um, I thought it would be an interesting exploration to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, I don't know how much I really expected to get out of it. Mm -hmm. But I thought, yeah, that would be... It does seem to be a, a take on the AR that nobody else is looking at, and that seems odd because I think people would. And now here at the end of it, I'm freaking thrilled. This is this is my one go-to rifle now. Yeah. Because it does everything as a conglomerate, it does everything better than any other rifle that I've got. I can't think of what I would what I would want that could possibly surpass what we've been able to accomplish in this. Yeah. The project started off as a gee whiz. What happens if we revisit what would the stoner do was a play on the idea of why do we not use a gun now that's with modern materials right that's also lightweight yeah oh and and the pencil barrel from Faxon was a huge part of that as well that's yeah. another video that was uh, that's probably the most important the, the part. driving yep. probably single most driving but piece. the pencil barrel is an example of where modern manufacturing capabilities have changed some of the things that he tried to do then and made them viable now yeah so the polymer lower would have been something he would have at least considered or looked at i think so because yeah. it's a modern modern manufacturing and capability and material that's lightweight the pencil barrel it was able to do what his, or at least the original ones could not, which is maintain at least uh, one MOA of accuracy shift, even under high heat stress. Right. The original ones shifted four and five when we tested it. And in random directions. In random directions. Obviously the carbon fiber M lock rail is way ahead of its time in that regard. The Oz sighting systems, etc. But no, you don't see too many people visiting this idea of why is the AR become this 12 pound behemoth thing? Right. And, and, and that's what this was. And when we got done with the project, it actually surpassed all of my expectations. Excellent. And yeah. when you're running like this gun in a match or in a timed environment or at a training event, because I took it to training events as well, mm -hmm. the gun, as I'm going to use your words, the gun disappears. And what you're trying to achieve becomes your goal. And all you know is that the gun's doing it with you, right? not against you. Yeah. It's like driving a car that is well designed. Yeah. You don't notice the steering wheel. You don't notice the pedals. You're just driving where you're attempting to drive. Same thing happens with this. You don't notice the rifle. You just, there's the target. Yeah. Make hits, next target, make hits. And, and make hits is literally pull the trigger when you want to hit the target. Yeah. Almost always, even yeah. at distance. Yeah. It's amazing. So unless you've tried something like this or tried one of these rifles, you're not going to really, you can't grok this unless you do it. The weight is something that just you can't get across on camera, unfortunately. And the balance and all the other things, there's lots, yeah. in aggregate, this becomes better than the sum of, it's, it's the sum of its parts that make it what it is. Yeah. And, and people that tried it at the match, we had people at Two Gun Match pick up a What Would Start to Do Carbine, they're like, and then, no joke, a month later they had one. Yeah. Because it changes the way you look at the AR. You know, there may be a few follow-ups to this video, even though this is the final conclusion of the project, because we've got a couple sort right. of been there, done that military guys who have expressed curiosity about it. Mm -hmm. And there are some people I would love to put, again, you can describe it all you want, but I'd love to put one of these in the hands of a couple specific people. Yep. And just see what their reactions are. Yep. Um, this is not something that we're advocating, like, the Army should go replace all of their M16s with these. Obviously, no. Um, but I would love to hear some reactions from people with some, some very substantial real-world experience. Here's what I would say to that. A lot of people take everything out of context. Is this polymer lower, for example, ready for military issue use? No, I don't think it is. I think what we're doing here is when you look at what we did with the project, for someone who's really a student with it, not for general issue, but someone that needed something specialized, they could they could handle this. Yeah, I Competitors so. can handle it. Civilians can handle it because they're not putting it through the rigors of war, per se. Although... This stock, this, this lower does handle a lot. What I would say is what you want to look at with what we did with this project is take the concept 
and the parts that we were able to acquire and apply it towards future endeavors with where the AR right. should go. An A3 or A4 or A5 or sixth generation version of a G-Wax lower could be something improved upon this, but if we take the concept to keep moving forward with, man, an AR really shouldn't be more than six pounds. Right then we could do amazing things. I think so. Yeah. So I think this has been a really popular project on InRange, uh, more than I expected. Hopefully the future ones will be just as popular. I don't care if it's popular or not. Yeah. I'm thrilled that we did it because I really love the outcome. And so what people should also realize is we're not selling these rifles. No. This is not something we're making money on. We dealt with multiple different companies. On. <laughs> Someone's selling them because I'll tell you what, when I tried to get the parts to build my new upper, no. yeah. uh, it was a little difficult at some point. Ian could not get the parts for his own rifle. Yeah. But what people think, oh, they're just shilling for this concept. No, no we're not because we do not make money from GUX, we don't make money from Faxon, we don't make money from Holosun, I don't even know if they know who we are, certainly don't make money from a PVS-14 manufacturer. None of these things garnered us any income on InRange. No. What we did is work with companies that had forward-leaning, interesting products that could apply to the project and then worked with them to collaborate on building what we wanted to build. Right. And we've had people say, why don't you have someone else build the rifle? The problem is it's an aggregation and an amalgamation of multiple different companies' <laughs> products. It's like GWAX makes this, Faxon makes that, Holosun makes this. Arrow makes the upper. Geisley makes this, KE Arms makes that. And that's a hard proposition to deal with is to get yeah. one guy to want to aggregate all of those different divergent companies into one product. Yeah. So, and it's a pain in the butt trying to coordinate something like that. And we just want to do other things. Yeah, but the point is we're not selling these. What we're saying is what I'm going to do is list all of these subcomponents, every piece of it, now that we are certified on all of them that are in this carbine. Yep. We're going to have a list on the inrange.tv website. There'll be a link in the description below of every subcomponent with a link to it and an average cost. Yeah. Last point. Everyone says, why'd you build those elite expensive rifles? They weren't that bad. Some of the parts are expensive. Some of the parts are cheap. It's certainly not a super expensive <laughs> our handguard cost more than our optic. Yep. Um, we went for the parts that did the things that we wanted to do without considering cost, either high or low. Um, honestly, I don't remember what the final cost came to. I'll do the math. Uh, we'll do the math. We'll have it up there. Because, full disclosure, some of these parts were donated to us. Some of them we purchased. So... That said, I did do the math at one point. I'm not going to say the number on video because then I have to correct it anyway. Yeah. But when I got to the number of what a full carbine was in terms of cost, it was significantly lower than a number of what you would consider high-end manufacturer ones. Yeah. If you went to Daniel Defense and said, give me your best stuff, click, it was that was dramatically more yeah. than a what would Stoner do carbine built with all the components we have here. This is going to cost you substantially more than a $450 beater, you know, oh God, we made too many of these before the election closeout kind of that you, junk rifle. That I'm going to argue you don't want anyway. No, you really yep. So, but that, that, I think that we covered all of the topics, hopefully, yes. of the What Would Stoner Do project, why, the goals, where we got to, the achievement that we made with it as a, as a team, as well as with collaboration with others. And I think we've come up with, in my opinion, best of breed AR you could buy right now. I think so. Yeah. You may not agree, but that's okay. You haven't tried it. <laughs> Guys, thank you for tuning into this. If you like this kind of content and this kind of deep dive on this stuff, because we're going to be doing more of that in the future on other topics. Yes. Um, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We bring, uh, hopefully bring a historical reference point to our topics and efforts, which was why we did What Would Stoner Do? Yeah. The historical reference of what the AR was supposed to be versus what it became. And this project was a return to those roots. And it's because of Patreon support that we can do this, because we have no monetization from YouTube or any other of our, of our video distribution networks, really. Full 30, tiny little bit, but it's irrelevant. Yeah. This is a crowd-supported project, and it's only because of you guys that we can do the kind of things we're doing. Please consider supporting us on there if you can. If you can't, the biggest other thing you can do is subscribe to the channels and share the videos with your friends. Thanks for watching. Thank you.